What's up guys, Ben Pollock here and we're about to get in the next installment of Unfucking Your Program. When we left, left off last time, we were talking about kind of the basics behind, basic theory behind incorporating some bodybuilding accessory work into your powerlifting routine. And so today we're going to get a little bit more into the specifics and we're going to start with exercise selection. So there's three things that I want to talk about today. Proportion, mind-muscle connection, and risk-reward. You might remember when we were talking last time how I ended by saying there's some stuff that maybe you can't control so much that goes into your appearance, stuff like bone structure or uh, muscle insertions. And that's true, but it's also true that there's some things that you can do to compensate if you have maybe a not ideal bone structure, not ideal muscle insertions. And honestly, that stuff makes a huge, huge difference in your appearance. So, and this is a lot of what people talk about when they're talking about bodybuilding, they talk about proportion. So let's look at an example. Let's look at uh, having a tiny waist and narrow shoulders, or I'm sorry, having a, having a tiny waist and broad shoulders. That's what gives you that, uh, that X frame that people are looking for when, when they're looking at bodybuilders. And you could be genetically lucky, right? You could just have this really wide uh, clavicle and you could have this really tiny tapered waist, but most people don't have that. Most people are you know, pretty, pretty average. Even, even a lot of professional bodybuilders kind of average in that bone structure, bone structure department. And what you can do, obviously, you build your shoulders bigger, right? It makes your waist look narrower. It makes your body look wider or your upper body look wider. I think most people know that. What a lot of people get hung up on is they say, okay, so I need really big ass shoulders. So let me add in some heavy pressing to my routine. And in some aspects, that's a good thing. I'm obviously a very big proponent of heavy compound lifts. But when we're talking about the scheme of, I'm gonna add some bodybuilding to my powerlifting program, adding heavy pressing is not the way to go if you're talking about supplemental exercises. The problem is heavy pressing is a really, really difficult movement, right? An overhead press takes incredible uh, abdominal strength, it takes upper back strength, it takes shoulder, tricep, obviously. And when you're adding all that stuff in as supplemental exercises, you're pretty much gonna fuck over your bench press unless you program it really, really carefully, and we already looked at how difficult it is to write a really good powerlifting program. So throwing another kink in the mix is almost impossible for most people. It's not just your bench press either. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are pretty familiar with the fact you go in with short ass shoulders, you can't get under the bar properly to squat, you can't get your lats in the proper position to deadlift, so it really can interfere with your strength-specific work. So instead of using these heavy compound lifts, we can use isolation exercises. And this is why one, one reason why you see a lot of bodybuilders use isolation exercises. It's because, okay, well, I'm still hitting my, my shoulders with my heavy bench pressing, so let me do some isolation work to just get that extra bit of volume in. And if you think back to last time, volume is one of the big things that can add to muscular size. That's one aspect of proportion. The other aspect of proportion deals with kind of creating that illusion. So when we're talking about, let's go back to our example of shoulders. If I'm doing all my work for my front delts, which is mostly, it's gonna be your bench pressing, it's gonna be your over pressing, it's gonna be your front lateral raises. Um, I'm gonna develop the, the front delt, right? Um, and your delt obviously is made up of three different muscle heads. So if I'm developing this front delt, if you look at me from straight on just like this, especially if I'm letting my shoulders drop, which a lot of people with overdeveloped front delts do, it's not gonna make me look as wide as if I develop this medial head, right? The part on the side. And you can see that, right? Just watch, here I've got my shoulders slumped like I had overdeveloped front delts, which I do. And here I'm kind of flaring out those, those medial delts. You can see how much of a difference it makes in, in my width. Uh, the same can be said for the rear delt, right? When you're looking at the side. So again, I have my shoulders slumped forward, those rear delts are hiding. I pop them out and if I develop them, it's gonna make me look wider from the side, which is really nice for your upper body. So to target the, those muscles, it's often almost necessary to use isolation exercises. It's very difficult to find some type of compound exercise that's gonna target your rear delts, it's gonna target your, your medial delts, and that's why we add in lateral raises, that's why we add in bent over uh, raises, why we add in face pulls, band pull aparts, that sort of thing. This can really make a big difference in your appearance, even though they're not gonna add that much muscle relative to your squat, your bench press, and your deadlift. Uh, let's take another example. Let's take um, bench press, all right, and triceps. So Larry Wheels, phenomenal physique, fucking incredibly strong bencher, right? 600 pound bencher. If you look at him though, and you compare him to a bodybuilder who maybe only benches 400 pounds, 
um, but has been bodybuilding for a long time, there's a good chance the bodybuilder is going to have better tricep development. And that's because for the most part, the bench press is really only developing this lateral head of your tricep, but most of the size of your tricep is coming from this long head that you can really only hit with overhead extension exercises. It's possible to hit it with other stuff, but it's pretty difficult. So that's, again, another opportunity for you to include this isolation work. You can do some type of overhead dumbbell extension, really get your long head, but it's not going to fry you the same as a heavy bench press would. And so it's easier to incorporate into your program. Okay, so that covers proportion. Let's move on to mind-muscle connection. This one's a little controversial when you look at the research because it's really hard to isolate. It's really hard to say, well, you know, this person has better mind-muscle connection, so they're growing more, they're better hypertrophy, better strength, whatever. That's true. The thing is, is it's true that it's very difficult to figure out exactly what this is doing. The thing is, I can promise you, once you learn to activate certain muscles better, it's going to carry over into everything. All right? So let me give you another example. For a long, long time, I had really, really tight traps, right? Because I'm doing all this heavy deadlifting, my trap's super tight, really kind of bunched up like this, and I have a really strong lower back, really overpowering lower back. Very difficult to get my traps out of play. What that does is mean when I'm doing almost all my other exercises, my pressing movements, my pulling movements, my squat and deadlift, I can't deactivate those traps. If I can't deactivate those traps, I can't activate the other muscles that I want to activate. Once I got a lot of body work on them, and once I learned to use the other muscles, and we'll get, get to that in a second, I was able to get my traps out of the way, use my lats more effectively. I could put my torso in a better position for squats, for bench presses. I could activate them better on pull downs. I could feel my whole lat working all the way down here instead of just up in the armpit area. So how do you develop this mind-muscle connection? How do you make sure that your lats are fine and not your traps, right? There's not one easy way to do it. It's not, not like I can point to a particular exercise for a body part and be like, this is how you form that mind-muscle connection. But I can tell you it's much, much easier if you're doing super high rep sets. And I'm sure you know this, right? You do super high rep sets, no matter what you're doing, something's gonna start burning. So let's say you're doing a set of barbell curls and you're trying to do a set of 50. Halfway through, something's gonna be on fire. Some, that lactic acid's gonna build up and one of your muscles is really gonna be burning. If it's your shoulders, you know you're not really using your biceps effectively, right? So you can use this as sort of a tool to be a part of your trial and error process in order to determine, okay, what exercises can I really, really feel my muscles working? All right? It might be something really bizarre. For me to really get my pecs firing, I had to do a bunch of incline flies. That was really the only thing where I could feel them working. But once I got that, so I was doing super high rep incline flies, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, that's what it's supposed to feel like. Then I can go back over to, I can go to my bench press, I can go to my dumbbell press, whatever, my machine press, and I can feel my chest working. I can really squeeze it better. And all that stuff is going to add up over time. It's going to be a process, but it's really going to contribute to your overall development. This is also why, if you go to any of the Unfuck Your Program, any of the programs, when I talk about supplemental work, it's almost always really high rep stuff, right? That's to help you develop this mind-muscle connection. In addition, when we go back to our overall scheme of programming, Super high rep set you have stuff, you have to use super low weights, and so it's not that demanding on your recovery. The intensity is going to be so low that it's really not going, and again, we're talking about intensity as percentage from one rep max, it's not really going to be that demanding systematically, so you're going to recover from it a lot better. And then the third thing we're going to talk about is risk reward. So you'll see a lot of bodybuilders who rely almost entirely on machine work, they avoid heavy squats and deadlifts, and people talk about, oh man, this guy's a wuss, he's not like training hard, whatever, he's just using a bunch of drugs, or he has the genetics, whatever. And in reality, if you're focusing on bodybuilding, you really have to consider risk-reward ratio um, a lot. When you're powerlifting, injury is a fact of the sport. You will get injured. Hopefully it's nothing major, right? Hopefully, whatever, you tweak a knee or quad or whatever, and maybe you're out for a week or two, and then you rehab, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's a necessary part of getting stronger. You have to train hard, you have to train heavy, because your goal is to be able to lift as heavy as possible. But again, think back to the last lecture where we talked about how um, the training that you do in the gym is not as directly tied to your ultimate goal in bodybuilding as it is for powerlifting. Because that's the case, there's really not all that, all that much reason to do exercises that carry a pretty high risk of injury. 
That's a lot of the same reason why you don't really see people advocating like behind the neck pressing or pulling pull downs all that often. It's the same reason why you don't see these bodybuilders doing heavy ass squats and deadlifts. It's because, hey, I can get the same development doing a lot of isolation exercise and adding a lot of volume. Why am I going to be risking spending a couple weeks out of the gym or maybe worse, tearing a muscle and changing how my physique looks when it's not going to make all that much difference in the scheme of things? And so that's really, really important. Now, don't get it twisted. If you're just starting out and you don't have that base level of muscle mass, you have to do the heavy compounds. That's how you're going to get that base level of muscle mass that you can build on and refine and make more aesthetic. But if you've already got a pretty decent level of muscle mass, you're kind of more or less where you where you where you want to be, and your primary goal is physique. I would recommend not maybe not doing so much of that heavy training. At least not pushing it to the percentages where you think, hey, you're risking injury. So that's going to wrap up this lecture. Uh, I know we didn't get into the specifics of exercise selection, and that's because it's highly, highly individual, like we just talked about. Maybe you don't need to work on your medial delts as much. Maybe you need to work more on your biceps. Maybe you feel your your um, pecs working better with incline flies than you do with dumbbell bench presses. Maybe somebody else feels better with dumbbell bench presses than incline flies. And risk reward, this is always kind of, it's your personal judgment, right? I can't tell you what exercises are worth the risk and what aren't. But what I can tell you is that if you really spend some time thinking about your exercise selection, your overall program is going to be a lot stronger and your overall fit strength and development is going to be a lot better off for it. So I hope that helps. Um, again, I'll put some helpful links below as well. There'll be a write-up on Barben and I'll link to that when it's out. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. I really appreciate it.